Greetings to everyone. We have celebrated International Mother Language Day 2023 on 21st of February. International Mother Language Day recognizes that languages and multilingualism can advance inclusion and sustainable development goals, focus on leaving no one behind. UNESCO encourages and promotes multilingual education based on mother tongue or first language. It is a type of education that begins in the language that the learner masters most and then gradually introduces other languages. This approach enables learner whose mother tongue is different from the language of inclusion to bridge the gap between home and school to discover the school environment in a familiar language and thus learn better. Collabod, a platform who is constantly working on promotion and preservation of art and culture, has grown to be a resource hub aiming to provide services in the arena of management of heritage, language, literature, art and culture of India. On behalf of Kolabod, I, Dr. Arunima Das Chetia, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Garvi College, feels extremely happy and privileged to interact with linguist Dr. Hari Madhavre, Assistant Professor, School of Language, Literature and Culture in the theme of language sustainability in an era of multilingualism. Dr. Hari Madhavre is an assistant professor in the Center of Linguistics, School of Language, Literature and Culture Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He did his MA and PhD in linguistics from JD. He authored six books and more than 15 research papers in different peer-reviewed journals. His research areas are mainly applied linguistics, morphology, field ling linguistics, folklore, language and politics, discourse analysis. He has supervised many MPhil and PhD scholars in the field of linguistics, and a good number of PhD scholars are now working with him in different areas and different languages, uh, and basically in linguistics. He has delivered many invited talks, presented more than 50 research papers in different national and international seminars and conferences. He has conducted field work in various lesser known languages of India, namely Garwali, Kumauni, Dhundari, Sekhavati, Avadi, and Rajbangji. Welcome to Dr. Welcome to Kalabo, Dr. Ray. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Arunima. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Yeah. So, uh, since we are living in a time when multilingualism is contributing to the development of the inclusive societies that allow multiple cultures, worldviews, and knowledge systems to coexist and cross-fertilize. So the theme of 2023 International Mother Language Day, multilingual education and a necessity to transform education aligns with recommendations made during the Transformation Education Summit, where an emphasis was placed on indigenous people's education and languages. Multilingual education based on mother tongue facilitates access to and inclusion in learning for population groups that speak non-dominant languages, languages of minority groups, and indigenous languages. As such, will you please share some views on having the benefits of learning or having an education in our mother tongue? OK, so thank you. Really interesting questions. Uh, now, if you look at uh, mother tongue, you know, and in especially in Bangla also we call it Matri Bhasha. And yes. uh, there is a saying that uh, mother 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 tongue is mother's milk, you know, Matri Bhasha, Matri Dukdes Saman. Yes. So in my understanding, the world will be a you know happier place if we really if we could teach the ch you know, children in their respective mother tongues, you see, and whichever the mother tongues we are talking about. And uh, Teaching in mother tongues, there are several benefits of learning in mother tongues. And uh, as we all know that the child can uh, easily understand, grasp the concepts. And the other thing you see, uh, the kind of dominant languages, the way it is being introduced in school curriculum, we had seen that if the children, they speak in their mother tongues, the dominant language people, whether it's the teacher or the other students, they also mock at or ridicule the students also. I think that part, because they have a particular accent or whatever the language or community they, they belong to. So in my understanding, at least equal treatment by the teachers 
and at the same time teaching in mother tongue there will be a development of strong mental and cognitive skills if you are talking about the children you see and uh, on the other hand you look at uh, the tribal tribal areas though i do not want to use the word tribal but that's what in constitution also also it is written so in the tribal areas the dropout rate uh, will be less you know and there are many reasons for dropout um, and also there will be positive attitude towards his own mother tongue and also the linguistic community and it's not only about his mother tongue also others mother tongue so the student or the learners will try to respect the diversity or the kind of plural linguistic culture we do have in in our nation and not only in the nation let's say but in general if you try to look at uh, the kind of one nation one language policy which was earlier practiced by european countries america as as well you know so one nation one language policy so that policy cannot be applied in indian context in a, in a way that kind of monolithic so uh, and otherwise if you look at there could be lots of scope for the community members let's say the mother tongue education is being taught let's say to the children and it is introduced in school colleges and universities and also as a result there will be lots of scope for the mother tongue speakers as well as the community members try to understand you see so person translating text from one mother tongue to other mother tongue in india if you look at there are many languages let's say at least 1961 census says uh, 1652 mother tongues i'm talking about 1961 mm -hmm. so there were enough opportunity let's say of all the speakers and um, so theoretically it is possible and i'm sure that uh, strong will power and if there is government support uh, so we can teach our children especially i'm talking about indian context we can teach them in in mother tongues and uh, but what happens you see the ground reality is little different if you look at it so the kind of public documents and policies made by the government and other agen agencies so whichever the agencies we are talking about uh, whether it is let's say whichever the agencies let's say indian constitution if you talk about indian constitution somewhere around article 350 uh, 350a uh, 350a which was amended uh, in in 1956 so categorically talking about facilities for instruction in mother tongue at primary stage 350a so there is a provision 350b it's saying that special officer for linguistic minorities all these linguistic minorities there will be office, a special officer who will be appointed by the president and the that special officer will look after this UNESCO, even if we talk about, we are celebrating, let's see, we are celebrating the International Mother Language Day. UNESCO also. So the International Mother Language Day, which was announced in 1999, uh, and every year UNESCO has a theme. More or less, if you look at the theme, you know, so uh, talking about linguistic diversity, uh, multilingualism. So every year, I think this year's the theme is multilingual education. A necessity to transform education okay so uh, this is where there are lots of several benefits and i'm sure and government you know has come up with a very good proposal nep 2020 and uh, if it is really implemented well in different schools colleges and also in the universities i'm hopeful that uh, it is very positive documents so the dropout rates and uh, will be less and it's ensuring that universal access to uh, universal access to education to all levels promoting multilingualism and power of language in teaching and learning again talking about multilingualism that's the um, and respect for diversity respect for the local context and you are aware of that somewhere uh, the home language and local language will continue to be taught as a language wherever possible that's what nep is talking about nep 2020 so, and in different way, if you look at, there are different efforts are being made uh, in Indian context. If you are aware of this MLE program, multilingual education program, which are uh, still is going on in Odisha. Uh, this recently, this Mahindra Kumar Mishra, as a famous folklorist, 
and also yes. MP yeah. expert. He is getting this UNESCO International Mother Language Award this year in Dhaka. Oh, that is so. so yeah, great. Prime Minister Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is you know giving this award, International mm -hmm. Mother Language Award by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. There are many people in Indian context who is saying that the multi we need multilingual education. So I think uh, that's what you are asking about benefits. There are several benefits, lots of benefits, and uh, we need support especially. Thank you for this question. Yeah, that is actually uh, so important uh, to have our basic education in mother tongue. It's true. And uh, when we say language matters, language not only uh, it's a medium of communication, but at the same time, uh, language matters in case of spiritually, uh, spiritual activity, cultural aspects, and all the emotional aspects. It's not only uh, we are talking about some grammar or some sentences, probably. And uh, when we talk about uh, written spoken words, this is also an art form, an art form, a way of for uh, valuing the tradition, culture, which has been passing down from generations. And when we lose a language that is a loss which is like we are losing a culture so um by the same measure when we say language needs to be preserved then we are talking about tradition customs are also getting preserved and uh, it is also like it is as i said it's not only sentence structure grammar but it has it language is a history of discourse uh, history and a discourse and a custom and a heritage. So uh, when we say, uh, when we talk about endangered languages in the context of the um, whole world, especially in a place uh, place like India, we are talking, We I feel it's a very terrible situation if we uh, really uh, lose our language and it is under some problem. So uh, what is the situation at this moment regarding the endangered languages? Because we have got so many, as you also said, that it's a diversified uh, place and we have so many languages. So uh, now, since uh, it's an era of globalization, multilingualism, what is the present scenario? And what uh, are the, what are our um, individual responsibility towards saving one language? OK. So now, you, if you try to understand this, uh, the concept to some extent, mainly endangered language. So we try to make the distinction between endangered language and indigenous languages as well. So what is endangered or what is indigenous? So in Indian ca context, there are many languages which are indigenous languages, not endangered languages. But mm -hmm. yeah. So, so endangered language, so what is endangered language? Try to understand, like end endangered species we talk about. There are many species, let's say, going to be extinct or going to die and no longer will they will exist, let's say, in the age of globalization. And uh, so there are different factors, let's say, natural factors, and especially in talking about uh, language endangerment. So linguistic imperialism is also one of the factors, linguistic imperialism of especially the dominant languages, let's say. So you come from Assam, I come from Bengal, let's say. So it is not only Bengali or Assamese, to some extent, you know, um, it's not only English or Hindi in Indian context. At the same time, Bengali or Assamese are equally responsible for subduing other, other less unknown languages, whether it's tribal languages and other languages, less unknown languages for that matter. Now, talking about Indian context, you know, Indian scenario, as you were mentioning that India, at least five language families, we all know, Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Tibuta-Barma, Austro-Asiatic, you know, and um, Andamanese, you know. So, so now, now if, you, if you talk about, so how many official languages we do have? 22 official uh, recognized languages, scheduled languages we talked about, you see. And uh, more than 87 languages are used in print media. And 71 languages are used in the radio, if you, if you look at. And uh, Saito Academy uh, gives award to more than 35. Though 22 languages are recognized, Saito Academy gives award in 35 languages, you see. Mm. So the number of languages, if you look at, 
following Grierson's linguistic survey, so survey which started in 1888, culminated in 1927, you look at the little grammatical description, 179 languages and 544 dialects. So after Grierson survey, if you look at somehow 1951 survey, 1961, so 1951 survey says that uh, there are 845, 845 languages. 1961, 1652 languages. Now coming back to, this is what the crux of the matter and at times as a linguist you see what is happening. After 1971 onwards, the census report which came and categorically mentioned that if you have less than 10,000 speakers, do not include those languages as mother tongues. Try to understand the apathy to some extent, you see. And UNESCO is saying that, and UNESCO is saying that if the languages, if you have less than 10,000 speakers, those languages are endangered. And in the Indian context, it is other way around. See, so this really, you know, so those languages you need to protect, preserve, or need help, government support. And you are just not listing down those languages in a way, you see. So um, now that's what pro Professor Ganesh Devi, he says that uh, after 1961, maybe more than uh, 150 languages must have disappeared. And you never know within the end of the century, more than 50 or 60 languages are going to die. So UNESCO came up with the list. Now, if you look at UNESCO came up with the list and there are at least in 2018 list. So one of the language, uh, Nicobar's language, my student, uh, uh, he worked on this language, you see, uh, Saneno, one of the Nicobar's language, Austroasiatic group, and uh, he worked on the nominal morphology of this endangered language. So you from Assam, uh, you, you know all these Thai Kadai languages, Thai Aham and Thai Turung. Yes, yes, Thai Aham. Thai Aham and Thai Turung. Yeah, yes. Now and it is also almost uh, people almost are extinct, almost extinct. Mm -hmm. And it's Thai, Thai Kamang is so uh, less than 50 speakers of Thai Kamang. So something like uh, this is really interesting to look at. You ask about the question that what is going to happen to some extent uh, uh, if languages uh, die. Uh, what are the going, things going to happen? You see, it is basically uh, in our understanding languages, many things, you see. It's not only a matter of communication. It's many things. It's a vehicle of thoughts and ideas, a matter of political controversy for that matter. Marker of our identity, where I come from, which community I belong to. A factory nation building, nation building in the sense uh, Bangladesh, the whole nation. And there are many nations which are created on the basis of language. Indian state formation, if you talk about, that's also based on language, reorganizing of a state. Gujarat, Gujarati, Bengal, you know, Bengali, Assam, Assamese. So reorganization of the states. So language is part of our culture, our society, history, traditions, and who we are. It is heart of human life and its existence. It's a human essence. If you follow Chomsky, he's talked about human essence. So Loss of language means loss of everything. The loss of cultural and ethnic identity, the loss of folk traditions, the loss of medicinal knowledge and practices, and in general, in general, society's accumulated knowledge of thousands of generations. So Ganesh Devi, he says that each dead language takes away culture system. A unique way of looking at the world disappears. Look at this. The world is disappearing in front of us. So. What can we do at least as a linguist? That's the quote thing, you know, I try to tell our student that at least maybe we cannot stop this. But to some extent, at least we can describe and document the languages before it is extinct. As a linguist, you can write a grammar, dictionary, collect the folklore and the traditions, and at least try to mediate between the community member and the government so that government can come up with some effective policy so that the language will not die. So, yeah, thank you. Really interesting things, you see, interesting questions. 
So uh, when we talk about um, linguistics, uh, it's just uh, we say scientific study of a language. But when we go deeper and deeper into a language system, how it originates, how the, everything happens, then it's no, it's more than a language. It's not only we are talking about syntax, semantics, morphology. Probably that's the way we have to, but the emotions related to uh, the language, that is something which we can only feel, but um, we cannot uh, say, we cannot express. So that is what I feel a la the function of a language is. So, and uh, that actually you have answered my, uh, what I was uh, planning to ask the same question that what, uh, how to save and what are we as uh, being a linguistic, uh, a normal person, a layman and a linguistic can do to save a language. So that was my second question, which you have already uh, answered in. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt, I'll again, maybe We'll talk about the UNESCO's criteria, if you allow me. Yes, please. please. We'll be very happy. <laughs> so something like, you know, uh, talking about how to uh, protect let's say, the dying language or the endangered languages, you see. And uh, this is why uh, I always talk about this in the class that uh, there is an attitude, let's say. When you learn a language, we need to have an attitude, whether it's positive attitude or the negative attitude. And this negative attitude, if you have negative attitude towards your own language, that means the language is going to be lost or extinct. And other thing I always talked about government and institutional support. So that's the thing already talked about. What I want to emphasize here is the UNESCO's criteria for language vitality and endangered framework. So UNESCO has come up with five, uh, nine factors. So what are those factors? Factor one, UNESCO is talking about intergenerational language transmission skill. Intergeneration language transmission skill is that whether the parents are, you know, passing on their language to the next generation or not. That is the, so they will try to measure it. Absolute number of speakers, the real numbers of speakers, how many speakers are there in that. Uh, promotion, uh, proportion of speakers within the total population. So let's say Taikadai in Assam, so within that Assam, Assam to total population, so Taikadai uh, total population, proportion of speakers within the total population. Trends in existing, existing literature uh, domains, so existing uh, trends in existing language domains. So whether the language is only spoken or written or is also extended to media or some other places for that matter. So that's the, what's the trend? Response to new domains and media when coming to uh, risk. So let's see if there is any new word formation, whether the uh, language has come up with new words or just borrowed the word from the dominant language, you know. So how it's responding. Uh, materials for language education and literacy scale also. So whether it is being implemented in the education system or not governmental and institutional language attitude and policies, including official status and use. So whether that language is given any official status or not. And the factor eight, community members' attitudes towards their own language. That's what I was talking about, the positive attitudes. So UNESCO takes about this criteria. And amount and quality of documentation. So this is what amount, how much? We have you know, documented the language, you know. So UNESCO looks at this nine criteria. And if you are following these nine criteria and continue, you know, so language, may, may, maybe the language will sustain. And um, so somehow you, you, you are asking about, uh, in a way, uh, something like it is a really uh, challenging kind of scenario for us. You see, like, in one hand, uh, uh, we have to speak the dominant language, we have to learn the dominant language, and at the same time, we have to retain our mother tongue, you know, something like, and um, the scenario, uh, the question what you are posing, posing is that, uh, uh, mainly talking about uh, the endangered language scenario, was, was the question, the other question? Endangered language and also, uh, I, I have one more question for you. Endangered language, 
is one question, which probably uh, a linguist that has more responsibility towards uh, that, since he knows uh, the science of it and the ways to protect. And uh, but at the same time, I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, normally, uh, what we do when we talk about tradition, when we talk about our cultural uh, tangible or intangible items, we say uh, uh, to protect it, we have to pass into our next generation. For example, caring the elders, respecting elders. So then, how to talk? So these are some of our traditional aspects also, which we pass it on and we try to put a balance. Mm -hmm. in an harmony so in case of language what we feel now it has become very difficult also to keep a harmony to keep a balance because we at the same time officially we need xyz more language we need that that is a uh, demand but at the same time we have to uh, preserve and we have to show we have to keep our identity in balance so in that way uh this is, uh, you know, a very difficult situation sometimes. So that is one qu question with confusion question, or maybe sometimes it's. I feel it's very worrisome situation. <laughs> yeah. So this, is, I think, uh, there should not be any confusion in my understanding. Let's say I myself speak um, Rajbanshi. I speak Bangla because I'm from Bengal. And mm -hmm. I have, let's say, moved from Bengal now. I am in Delhi. So let's say, and this is where the language of bread and butter, let's say English and Hindi, let's say the communicative part, if you talk about the lingua franca, if you stay in, no, especially in North India, so you have to learn Hindi. So there are many people like me. I think you would be also the, in the same kind of scenario if you're talking about. so. So I do not find it like you know difficult to some extent that uh, I myself, let's say, when I communicate with the community members, Rajbanshi community community members, I do speak in Rajbanshi, and I do not have that kind of uh, uh, whatever you know that attitude or negative attitude towards my language. So there are many people. The problem is that there are many people they do not want to associate with the language or the linguistic community they are from because there is a negative attitude towards the language you see so um, so in my understanding so learn the dominant language but do not ignore the local language of your mother tongue so there is nothing wrong with learning the dominant language because i know try to think about the nation as an ent integrity india let's say so the nation, the center in the Indian center, let's say union, has to communicate with the other states. And you have to be, let's say, if you want to be globally present also, and this is the language, English to some extent. So there is nothing wrong learning these dominant languages in a way, but at the same time respect. And there are many people, let's say, since I come from, uh, again, Rajbanshi community, so the famous uh, person Panchanan Burma, I do not know whether you have heard about his name or not, Panchanan Burma, he wrote in Beng Bangla, let's say, and uh, also in, in, in English, spoke in Hindi and English both, let's say, Bangla, Hindi, English, but at the same time he was talking about preservation and uh, documentation, uh, especially in Kamta Bihari, though he did not use the na name Rajbanshi the language he was talking about, Kamta Bihari. So something like there are many people for that matter, you see. So I do not find it kind of which, uh, kind of confusion or doubt. I think uh, as a parents, if we can possibly pass on our language to our next generation, because as I have right, point up, pointed out that language is not only about a means of communication, there are many other things language is. Okay. So in that case, uh, what I have, uh, we all, I think, uh, we all have noticed all these things. There are lots of code switching, code mixing in this uh, era of multilingualism. And probably what I feel in the context of all this, we have to know a language which completely uh, uh, try to, we should learn to 
learn a language and try to speak a language in its own way. Although in one phase, probably code switching, code mixing happens, but since it's also an art, I think speaking a language is speaking a language uh, rightfully, it's also an art. So that is, I think, uh, that's what I feel sometimes. Okay, so I uh, could see code switching or code uh, mixing, it's a kind of phenomenon, it's a modern day phenomenon. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, language, you try to understand that language is dynamic, it's changing. Yes. Yes. So the kind of English which was spoken by, let's say, spoken or written by Shakespeare, mm -hmm. or Milton, Byron, and Keats, and you bring back those, I mean, let's say Shakespeare and Byron, Keats are alive, the way English is spoken in USA or UK, they will be surprised that what, yeah. what kind <laughs> of English is using. See, so the kind of purity concept, you know, this is pure, this is impure, because language changes, code switching, code mixing, this is the phenomena of nowadays, let's say not even a single person, even if you talk about Hindi, whether is the, the person is from rural areas or from the metropolitan city or cosmopolitan city, he will definitely code mix and at times he will code switch. So it's a modern phenomenon. So this idea of, you know, the word if you talk about, the word we must have borrowed from one language to another language. And after mm -hmm. a certain period of time, the words, it because. sounds it's our own word. Let's say the word kalam. How do, what do you say in kalam and pen in Asmis? What is the word? Kalam. Kalam. Now, if you look at the word kalam, kalam, do you think it's our own word, Sanskrit word? No, it's an Arabic word, Pashwa Arabic word, kalam. But we take it for granted as if it's our own word. So, so something like this idea of purity, um, uh, even if you are speaking, code, doing uh, code mixing and code switching, this is totally fine, you see, like, uh, that's what language changes. That's the dynamic nature of language, you know. And uh, uh, since you belong to that, um, let's say, in literary studies, uh, mainly in English literature, look at Indian writing, mm -hmm. Indian English, for that matter. Indian English mm -hmm. have its own characteristics, neither like American English, nor like British English. Indian English has got its own characteristics or features for that matter. And that's what we are different. That's what True. we are different. Yes. Okay, so I take it like as a positive kind of things. You know, there is no much, no such prescriptivism is attached with it. That if somebody is speaking like this, doing code mixing or code switching, it is, it is bad. No, it is also a way of life. Characteristics we all do. of the language. It's, we all do. Mm. Yes, and I think uh, what I have seen in some in the young generation. They love uh, having code switching uh, this as a property of a language. They love to have different, different uh, words in their language, words from different languages and mixing it together and having uh, that kind of a sentence. And that is true. You see, look at the bilingualism concept, even if you look at it, if you have mm -hmm. at least. So who will code switch or code mix for that matter? Who will code switch? At least in your mental lexicon or mind, you need to have at least two language system. So code switching is also a really interesting phenomenon in the societal level. Let's say you two Assamese are speaking and one Bengali comes <laughs> and suddenly you switch over to another language. So either show that kind of affinity or maybe you just want to kind of, okay, get rid of us, you see. So there could be different factors also. So there are many other reasons also why we code switch and uh, in the cognitive level also, uh, if you look at the study also, um, earlier in the European and American context, monolingualism was appreciated, you see, earlier. Uh, so the studies earlier say that, you know, especially the bilingual or multilingual child are cognitively poor. That was the un understanding they had. But later on, after 1970s or after 80s, you see, they, they changed their understanding that, yeah, multilingualism is good, even multilingual or the bilingual child children are cognitively, uh, you know, uh, uh, compared to monolinguals are better. 
So when you know two or three languages or four languages, it's not only about the knowledge system of one or two, one language. At the same time, knowledge system of three or four languages. That means you are better in a way. And that is true. So especially, let's say, I know a little bit of Assamese. A little bit in the sense I can understand, but when it comes to speaking, so I feel really comfortable if I go to Assam or Odisha because whatever and uh, Assamese, if you look at uh, the dialect or the language I speak, Rajbanshi, which is very close to uh, Assamese, Rajbanshi and Assamese, very similar. For me, like, oh, very good. The moment I go, there is no problem as such. Whether I'm speaking to the uh, people of the rural areas or the cosmopolitan areas. This is such an interesting field, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So now I would like to know about your research ongoing projects, uh, because you have been working with many uh, people, many areas. And so many people are working, uh, doing research under your supervision. So please let us know about your work and what all uh, things you are expecting from the research. Oh my gosh. So I do not want to something like bit kind of blow my own trumpet to some extent. <laughs> so see, like I joined in Center for Linguistics in very early uh, in 2007 and started teaching uh, mainly uh, theoretical linguistics, you know, like morphology, generative morphology, morphology and syntax, and uh, introduction to linguistics, doing field linguistics with the eminent linguist Professor Anbita B. And um, so something like, you know, slowly and gradually, and uh, I supervised in different areas. So one of my students, uh, he did his MPhil uh, autism spectrum disorder. And uh, recently, another MPhil submitted uh, nominal morphology of Saneno. That's the um, that's the endangered language, you know, spoken in again Nicobar Island. And uh, and uh, some PhDs are already awarded in the area of applied linguistics, uh, in acoustic phonetics as well. Uh, and uh, two or three PhD submissions already have uh, taken place. One girl she submitted her PhD tense aspect mood in the regional varieties of Bangla. Uh, another student, uh, she submitted a PhD, uh, a comparative phonological study of Indian Sign Language, ISL, you see. Talking about this, you see, and uh, so in a way, uh, and when I was, you know, doing this, uh, especially, I'll try to tell you about one survey, uh, since you wanted to know about uh, my work and research areas. Uh, it's not only really one area, particular area, I have been working on it to some extent, you see. Uh, uh, so in 2000, uh, 2010, uh, I have been associated with a project. The project is Mother Tongue Survey of India. That's uh, the Mother Tongue Survey of India is like, again, census uh, operation. They collect the raw data. And in the raw data, you can understand that, uh, let's say the name of the language is Assamese. And uh, people may report it in very various manner. So what do you speak? Some people say that as me is Ahomia, Ahomia, or some people say, oh, I do not know what I speak. Or some people may say Desi, Dehati, or some people may say Patanahi, whatever. So, uh, so our job was, and uh, in 2001 census, the raw data they got that in Indian, there are 6,661 languages. That's the raw data. So our job was to find out whether these languages are exactly language or not, you know, try to come up with a mini sketch of all those languages. And uh, so I was involved with census, uh, census uh, operation those days and uh, carried out some minimal sketch of those special languages of Haryana and some other regions are also given to me. So was working on that part. And then uh, one project, uh, this UPOE project, I have been, I was working on. Still, it's going on. Uh, this phonological and lexical variations in Rajbanshi languages are different in depending on the social level as well as the regional level, as you can understand. You see, so I was working on the phonological and lexical variations of Rajbanshi. You know, that was one of the projects. And another project, which was given, short-term project given to me by CIL that trilingual dictionary of Rajbanshi. 
trying to look at the trilingual dictionary rajvamshi bangla and english you know that was the uh, idea uh, so and then regarding the project to some extent if you look at uh, uh, in a way uh, i this is my kind of you know like love for the subject especially the field work so from 2006 on 2007 onwards um, i have been associated with different film field linguistics courses and uh, Going to different places in India, uh, so the Garhwali, we worked on Garhwali uh, as with Professor Abhi, uh, Kumayuni again the language of Kumayan, Avadi, Dhundari, Gaddi, Gaddi spoken in Himachal. So, um, so somehow uh, you know, so that is my passion also the field linguistics or field work also you know and um, but. Uh, later on uh, this later on what happened uh, the kind of courses i was doing initially as i told you that i was teaching theoretical courses morphology syntax typology grammar uh, after 2017 you know uh, one of my colleagues she got retired and as a result uh, the other courses will have to be taught in the department let's say applied linguistics you see and stylistics discourse analysis so i started offering those courses applied linguistics stylistics discourse analysis and i can't tell you and that's what the real love for linguistics came out you know and uh, so i have been really enjoying linguistics after that i'm not saying that i did not enjoy before but really started loving the subject more because here the actual application begins so whatever the theoretical things i learned so and so the applied linguistics i'm talking about it has many things to offer you can connect to the real world and in a way try to give kind of solution to the problems whatever the problems problems related to language education policy making or somebody suffering in different language disorders you can offer certain solutions to the problems you see not kind of simply quacking theories quacking theories i'm talking about some people learned Chomskyan theory or that theory or that theory, you know, minimalism and that, or just trying to fit the data into the theory, not understanding why he is applying that particular theory. So somewhere it is really interesting, and that's what the researchers should understand that why they are doing their research. Is it simply for the sake of research they are doing, or there is some other motivations behind that? what is the implications of the research in the society so when i started teaching applied linguistics discourse analysis so i really feel like oh i can connect to the world connect to the real problem people are facing okay it's not the theoretical things um so really you know i i'm enjoying linguistics i would say you know that's completely i also being a student of linguistics applied linguistics is something which is more than a more than a theory which is more than a pen, pen and paper so it has got like it has got solution for several aspects when you were talking about autism this is again uh, i i have some of my friends in usa so <clears throat> what i have seen she seems to be one of my very good friend and both of her daughters are autistic by nature so when we were talking about the solution in the schools that they used to get so i that time i got this idea that this linguistic things linguistic solutions are something that the schools are also using as it's a treatment true. that's true so that is what um, this is something very uh, very different than normally we say humanities is only in pen and paper sometimes maybe but it's not only uh, it's more than that yeah uh, so this is a, such a nice uh, thing that we got to know from you now um, uh, since this uh, platform has been followed by several scholars and um, we would like to know a few things few uh few uh, you know projects where which need attention especially in which uh, some of the fields where scholars need to focus it the future scholars the web need to focus on will you please suggest some of them 
Okay, so um, I just always I to told you about my love for this subject, especially applied linguistics. You know, in a way, you know, telling other people that even if you do theoretical linguistics, try to kind of uh, apply your theory. You know, and so that is the thing. Uh, but in addition to that, if you try to look at this, you see the idea that the people who are doing research. They need to ask themselves that why they are doing the research. You see, so what the research will have, what kind of impact it it will have in the society? That's the question. Now, if we talk about NEP 2020, uh, 2020, the whole motto of this NEP also that one should be skillful, skill development should be there. So what happens? You know, that's what the real fun thing is that. once uh, many people have done phd or masters they know the thing theoretically but when it comes to applications they do not know and uh, uh, this is where you know like uh, i would like to share one uh, in bengal the person he got his appointment letter he is supposed to teach this uh, english you know and uh, in school level so what happened he came came up with the joining letters and the joining letter it was it was only type to one so the school principal said said that it so it is already type to one why don't why don't you um write in a single you know simple uh, in blank page that said this is that date i would like to join you know in english plain english so the teacher said that um, somehow uh, sir can i join tomorrow can i come back tomorrow see so try to understand somehow the teacher who will be teaching english and uh, not able to write and this is what i'm not blaming this teacher or that teacher somehow our education system is also such that you know there are many hanky panky are also going and you see so the goal should be like also skill development it's not only something like the theoretical things but also what is happening talking about the area today we are discussing sustainability so how can we sustain let's say how linguistics can sustain how human beings can sustain let's say in this world ever changing world so this is the question and i think you would be surprised to know that there is a field that's sustainable studies you must have heard about sustainable studies and the yes. sustain sustainable studies there are many people social science uh, in in environment science many people are there in like it's kind of liberal liberal arts kind of discipline many people come here so one of the things when you talk about sustainable linguistics and this is the new area uh, many people are discussing since you are talking about new areas or some of our scholars can yeah. uh, you know so sustainable linguistics uh it again the people in europe for in america if you look at so who are working on sustainable linguistic uh, sustainable uh, studies mainly anthropology some people in the social science anthropology and sociology people so you will not see people from linguistic to some extent so there it's a really complex interaction between environmental economic social and cultural factors which all contribute to sustainability and if there is let's say lack of all these factors so there may be doom and language is also a crucial component if you look at it language is also crucial component in achieving this sustainable life and world because the all the world knowledge also let's see talk about it is the in the in the language itself you see so there has to be a linguistic perspective or discussions on sustainability um, so though we have the kind of sociology and anthropological pers perspectives so that we can strengthen the inclusion of linguistics and language studies in sustainable uh, studies so this is what many people recently there will be a seminar um, workshop in finland university of Hel helsinki i'm planning to go there especially for this you know sustainable linguistics okay. and 
and uh, so uh, I think some of our researcher can can look up, you know, th think about this, you know, uh, areas and uh, so the somewhere people have been working on this uh, in the area of like eco linguistic. So that's what Halliday talked about linguistic field work. I was talking about linguistic field work, okay. language, linguistic. Do uh, language documentation, language maintenance and revitalization, and uh, center and kind of periphery relations. You know, so so all that kind of collaborative knowledge creation we talked about. You see, so this field, all this can be associated with sustainable studies. So under sustainable studies, there is another field of linguistics, which is sustainable linguistics. So the researcher, uh, so you can ask those kind of questions, who researches what, how, and whom in linguistics? How can linguistic research be sustainable for linguistics and for the speakers for that matter? And how can linguistics contribute to cultural, social, and environmental sustainability goals? So how can we contribute to this, you see? And the, think about this, let's say the whole world is not there. If the speakers are not there, so how uh, human human beings can survive for that matter, you see. And so there are many questions. Uh, so uh, uh, this is where the the idea, uh, to some extent, uh, linguistic diversity and the kind of multilingual uh, thing we were talking about, coming back to the, again the main agenda, you know, main motto of our discussion, you see. This kind of discussion is so resourceful. So I, uh, I, I'm really uh, thrilled, and I'm really, very really happy to have this conversation today. <clears throat> I think we uh, can uh, talk for a day or two about all these things. It will be <laughs> because this is uh, something which actually includes so many. It's overwhelming. Uh, thank you so much for joining today, and uh, we would like to invite you for some more discussion on some other session because um, I, or because of the time limitation today, I have to conclude this conversation. But at the same time, I'm feeling that there are so many things, so many areas that we need to cover and we also need to talk about and also we let the other people to know about because normally these are the conversation which are limited only in the conferences, seminars where <clears throat> general people, even if a graduate, undergraduate people, they hardly go, uh, hardly uh, attend. So it is limited only among probably uh, the scholars. And uh, But there are so many things that general people also need to know at this moment, because it's a responsibility not only for the scholars, but also for everyone. Uh, since we are moving towards globalization at this moment, we also need to keep our diversified culture alive. So, um, uh, I'm very happy that I had such a conversation with a person like you and uh, got to know many, several things. And uh, I'm, I am sure our audiences will be also very delighted and very content to uh, listen to your, um, uh, you know, uh, your words. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just I will end by concluding Rabindranath Tagore's, you know, quote, the famous that unity and diversity, nana bhasha, nana maut, nana poridhan, bibide yes. maje dekho milono mohan. Many languages, many views, many customs, but there is a unity in diversity. We need to have that positive attitude, and uh, we should expand and you know, also extend our helping hands to save our language. We must introduce our local language to the primary and secondary, and if possible, in the university, university education system. And government should also come up with kind of effective policies so that language, the languages we are talking about, endangered languages, that will not die and also face the challenge of the modern e world. Thank you for inviting inviting me and thank you, Kalavot. And I appreciate your effort. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. Thank you. Thank you.